famous One day I'll be able to say That I made it, I made it One day I'm gonna be real So, um, Everything is gonna be We are in Keta as I mentioned to you yesterday That we'll be coming to Having our field trip to Keta So um, this is the chief executive of this municipality called Honorable Sylvester Tonyeba. <laughs> Honorable Sylvester Tonyeba is the municipal chief executive. Of Honorable, this is the DECMA consortium members from Southampton, the UK, some members also from uh, Spain. German, India and France. No, we are coming there. <laughs> 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 the team, including French. Uh, who else have I missed today? Italy. 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 Yes. Italy. Italy. And then the Indian group, <laughs> the Bangladeshi group, and of course the Ghanaian group. So this is the whole team, and every six months we have a meeting. Fortunately, this time it is in Ghana, so we decided to come and This is the deck team, and this is Honorable Sylvester. Yeah, thank you very much, Dr. Cynthia. Uh, on behalf of the Qatar Municipal Assembly, I welcome you to Qatar. Uh, Qatar is one of the oldest towns uh, in the country. Uh, for some time now, uh, because of the rising sea levels, the area has been at the mercy of the tidal waves. Uh, fortunately, in the 80s, uh, government decided to come to our aid. Uh, Keta, we were told, this port, uh, you could travel uh, about three kilometers before you look at the sea. But today, the sea is just here. It has taken most part of the community. And the Keta is now the first shadow of its former glory. Uh, it is our hope that with the sea defense project, uh, Keta will bounce back to its uh, original glory. And we are hoping that your visit will open the opportunities for Keta to be restored to its uh, original status. So you are welcome to Keta. Uh, my able team will take you around to look at uh, uh, some of the important areas. The way it was before the, the, the sea defense was constructed, you, you will be told and uh, the, the effort we are making and the, 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 the adaptation uh, effort that, that uh, we are uh, making to restore the place. So you are welcome to Keta and uh, we wish you well and wish you a happy stay in Keta. Thank you very much. So once again, you are welcome. Thank you. Um, in the whole of Africa, we have 48 port and castles in Africa and then 44 dot the coastline of Ghana. Elmina Castle is the oldest in sub saharan Africa. It was put up in the year 1482 by the Portuguese. So another Portuguese fort in Azim for St. Anthony, also the year 1515. You also have the Cape Coast Castle 1650, uh, 1653 by the Sweden traders and the Christian book 1659 mm -hmm. by the Danish Norwegians. So the same Danish Norwegians came and put up this fort from 1700, they completed 1784. They were buying slaves from Togo, Benin, Nigeria, and other part of Gold Coast, now Ghana. So those slaves were transported by foot, kept over here for one or two months, transported over the Atlantic Ocean. Most of them were sold in a Danish, Norwegian island, St. Croix, St. Thomas, St. John. Formerly it was called West Indies, but now US Virgin Island. And then each of the rooms, or the dungeons in this fort take more than 100 slaves. But initially, no ventilation. It was after when the fort was sold to the British. That was the time they created the ventilation we are seeing today. So inside it, the slaves duplicate urinate, sleep there. And they were dying to in sanitary conditions. Even the water, they would pour it under the door. They have to use their tongue to lick it. Food were thrown to them through the window. They struggled for it. And finally, they used hot iron, which bear the name of the company, or the company coat of arm to mark very off part of their body for easy identification. And the trade by then was so persuasive that even the smallest community, they have to go on a war path in order to secure slaves, to get arms, to defend themselves when attacked. And unfortunately, one were then marched to establish slave market. We have the Atoko, 
not far from here, where the slaves were put on display, like any marketable commodity, and they were sold to the highest bidders. They also used shear butter or palm oil to rub the body of the slaves, just to make them very attractive to the buyers. And then Samuri and Babatus in the north, they were raiding, kidnapping, they channeled their slaves to the Kakashi, that's the northern side of Gota, all the way down here. So slaves coming from the north into the fort, they suffer terrible hardship. They were forced to march from sunrise to sunset without food, water, or minerals. Even some of them have no strength, they were left in the bush to die there. And those who were able to make it into the fort, they were sorted away, branded. And then they opened their mouth to estimate their age by the state of their teeth. They will count their teeth when it's up to the 32, they know that fully grown adult. So children and younger slaves were counted as quarter half to third piece of cargo, depending upon the estimated commercial value. So I end over here, we yes. think we don't have enough time to, uh, so we are so as we go in. in. Maybe you will take time. Yes. <laughs> These are some of the original ventilations along the forts. Mm. So all these were later created in 1850, when the British took over. 1850. Yeah, due to Napoleon war in Europe. So the fort was sold to the British at an amount of 10,000 pounds sterling in those days. So it has sold. Yeah. Mm. I'm taking the above. The governor and his commanders stood up and they've been looking at them. Oh. So some of the female slaves who have been sent upstairs for sexual abuse. So that's why along the coast here we have so many mulattoes. So we have names like Chris, Addison, Peterson, Mounts, and Holmes. And after the bathing, the water still remain here. If there's a shortage of good drinking water, they could give this water to the else to drink sometimes. Because we are in between two salty waters. Utah is more or less like an island between the lagoon and the sea, and all our west salty waters. So getting a good drinking water in those days is very difficult. One of the oldest Artifacts in this world, which belongs to the indigenous of people of Peter. So the Danish intended to take control of the whole coast. So they decided to put the vision among the tribe over again. So, but the people refused. So that brought this understanding, resulting into a war. And during the war, the chief of Peter by the name Toby Tegeli was killed. So now the people were now living without their leader. They decided to leave this place for peace to prevail. So when they were leaving, the Danish lay hands on this too. So that's why even those people today they celebrate a festival called Keta Sumetu Festival. And so then they have to come down here to call a mission for their sake. We have an enslaved pipe, mostly from the Netherlands and Denmark. Anybody who wants to use this pipe to smoke has to call a slave in exchange of some of these pipes. Then we have some of the old currencies used in the 17th, 18th century, both by the British and the Germans. And one of the oldest Danish guns used in the fighting. And over here you can see the plan of the fort. So this a fort that suffered a lot of destruction from the ocean, which means the quarter of the whole place has been washed away. So we'll show you the map where the ocean used to be, about two miles away from the port. So there was a tunnel that links to the shore. So today, all this part has gone. So this is where we are now in here. Exactly, yeah. So uh, if you want to identify the Danish fort, we, this is the bashing. They always have four bashings. So this is the kitchen. So this is the meal. We used in Africa in those days to grind corn, millet before food were being cooked. You know, maize actually is not from Africa, it's from Latin America. So when they brought it, our sisters planted there, they got so many food out of that maize. Today we have akle, uh, banku, you know, gary, different, different kind of food from that. So this is them, we call it a te in Ewe. And the people from Accra, that's the gang, also call it te. So you can see the similarity over there. Mm -hmm. So that's the storeroom where they kept some of the food that were being cooked. And then the cooking pan is also here. Mm -hmm. So this is where they used to torture them, especially the male slaves. These are the shackles being used to chain the male slaves. And that's for the females. And then they used their fingernails to scratch the ground. They thought they can have a way to escape from here. So, but unfortunately, they couldn't. So those rooms that has been washed away by the ocean, some of these holes can reach your knees, others can reach your waist, but still they couldn't escape. Materials which were being used in building these forts. So we have the oyster shells, mostly from the lagoon. And then this is the bricks that was brought from Denmark. When they took the slaves, when they were coming, they used it as a ballast to the ship. 
And where they brought these bricks from, that's the name given to this fort. Prince Einstein, meaning the stone of the prince. And then the reddish one, some from England and some from the Netherlands. So these are some of the original materials. Yeah, so even the fort extended up to where the ocean is in those days. So we have about 15 of these along the fort, but all were gone. So this is the dungeon. About 20 enslaved males were kept in here. Those are the slaves before they brought them to this place. They struggled hard. Sometimes they use cast net to throw at them. Sometimes they are the slaves who sacrifice themselves on behalf of their families. So when they brought them here, they knew those slaves were very angry slaves. They would leave them in chains and shackles after they were taking them across the Atlantic Ocean. Because of that, they slope all the gates. Even the water were being poured at the end of the gate. They used their tongues to lick the water. Even the food were being thrown to them. They used their mouth to eat it. So before shipment is ready, about 50% of the slaves kept here. Some died, some became blind. And then the local slaves among them, before shipment, they have a sad song which they always sang before taking them out of these boats. So now, clean one no be do rovo arachiagi. Koto safi clean one no be do rovo arachiagi. Jimala fu na bubo clean one no be do rovo arachiagi. Bororio, then you say, oh, in airway language, it's just like anticlimax. After completing a song, you say, oh, everybody have to respond. Oh, so the song means that beholding the wharf. Now we have come face to face with the grind. Koto Safi, one of the enslaved Africans, if you have any tear to share, you better share it now, or rather retreat. So this is the last song that will be singing before they'll be taken out of these schools. Listen to this history. But I will only tell this history so that it should be a guide. We should not let it happen. The problem of slave trade in those days, so it's not only in Africa. It's a worldwide problem. Because there are people in those countries who became a native slaves within their own country. So, but I would like or I'll appeal with you that you should try and take one thing from this place, or you learn you take one thing from this and send it to wherever you are coming from. Everywhere you are, you should remember that mankind or humanity, we are one. Irrespective of our colour, our religion, our culture, whatever is remember humanity, we are one. With this, we may have a lot of peace in this world. But if you continue to put other things first on our list, there might be no peace. For instance, if you take religion, for instance, some may say, oh, my religion is better than you. You also don't agree, we'll be fighting. If you talk about culture, some say my culture is better than you. Country, I'm from the rich country, you're from poor country. I think, but if you remember we are one, then we can sit and talk, love one another. At the end of the day, they say, oh, where do you come from? Where's your religion? I worship this. I think I believe in dialogue. So if this, we may have a lot of peace. So once again, you are welcome to Qatar. Yeah. I started talking about the, the civil engineering works on the sea, Qatar Sea Defense Project. You have already seen that the, the shoreline is all sandy. sandy. So to avoid the sea taking the rest of the land mm. after the construction, there was one design we call revetment. You can even see it, binding the, the shoreline with these rocks out across. And you can also see the other one there. Anytime we have the serious surge, the waves come beyond and hit even here. Secondary. Exactly. So that it may not necessarily take what is left over as the relics no, of the fort. The, the, and again, yeah. they can come. Yeah. But it, when it's going back, it will not even wash off any other thing. So, again, behind you, we'll be visiting the, what we call the groins. You see the stone pile over there? Yeah. That's the head of the groins, which is about, originally, it was constructed into the sea, about 245 meters into the sea, open sea. But now you can only see the head. So that means the, the sea action was piling sand in between the groins that we have. So you will see that after the last grind, the sea action, the erosion is still on over there. So 
That means we have to do the construction of the groins until probably we reach Aflau. And the Togolese will have to take it up. Uh -huh. So, exactly, we are just postponing the problem from this place to the other. To the, yeah, exactly. So, this is what the problem that we are having. I just want you to see this, what we call the revetment and that, the other one. The shore protection, this is what they did. So, we have been assured for the period of 99 years, we are safe. That's it. Yeah. No, no, no. What? The, the protest, the protest, protestation from the uh, community members will not. They have seen what had happened over the years. Yes, uh, we were saying two kilometers. Let's see, far. Uh -huh. Now, your, all the houses, the schools that we have. EP school, Zion, RC, and all that. They are all gone. The church and everywhere. And houses. Yeah. All there. So, how expensive is this construction of this revetment? The revetment? Yeah. How much? Maybe per meter or how much it costs? Maybe. maybe that one we have to refer. The details are there. No. Yeah. The project is. Uh, 84 million dollars. Uh -huh. Yes. Yes. And it's a combination of three methods. The, yes. The hard engineering and software. Exactly. So okay. They use the revenue and the drawings, and then they put so, them with sediment from the lab to nourish. Yes. So they okay. created the nourishment, and based on the nourishment, the drawings started attracting and trapping sediment. So they're dredging the land. Yeah, they dredge. Right? Yes. yes. So that technology, if we had had it earlier on, we would have even saved our shoreline. That's what I was saying. We were doing some metal defense those days, but everything is gone. And they started using wood. Uh -huh. Yeah, so initially they there. wanted to, the, the indigenous wanted to fight the sea, the, the sea yeah. erosion by using you know, metals. So they planted metals there, and then they started using wood. So everything went away. And finally, you know, we lost a lot of houses here. According to literature, about yes. 5,000 houses were lost in this area. So the government had to come in. So um, they had to come in and then protect. But the whole idea is to protect the, the Keta Township and then to um, also reclaim land. So that it was in two phase. Providing the protection, and that is what the revetment is doing. And then reclaim. So when you go down there, you realize that some areas have been reclaimed. Yes. And then new structures have been put up. No, no, new infrastructure yeah. or buildings have been put up. Housing to accommodate the people who were displaced, who have their houses in the ocean. Yeah. So that was the idea behind. Okay. Now we've done. They're still put in quite a vulnerable situation if, a, if there was a breach, aren't they? Yes. Yes, but uh, th th there are a lot of issues, you know, I mean, uh, some of us are green, We're, we are green uh, scientists, we believe in the green method of intervention, and uh, we tend to question the hard methods of intervention, because the hard method, you tend to transfer the problem from one side to the other. So you realize that he can bear me out, if you go to the downdrift side, the area is eroding seriously. Uh, uh, one of my master's students did the estimation and some areas, you know, on transits are eroding as much as about 17 meters per year. Yeah. Yeah, 17 meters per year. Yeah. Before the, the sea defense work here, um, Keta was eroding between four, eight meters per year. And it was massive. So when you go down there, you see areas that are now reclaimed from the sea. And um, it's a success story for us. You know, now the town is protected. But the, the question is, um, is it sustainable? That is the question, as, as you said. Fortunately for us, we don't have a change in the drift. The changes are quite minimal. So the net drift is from the east to the west. So with, the, with regards to trapping, the, the groins are doing extremely well. And if you can see, you realize that that groin there is almost covered. The Cape is down here, Cape St. Paul. is gradually building up. And that is one of the impact 
of the sea defense project. So it's doing very well. And again, if you go to Togo, some areas in Togo, although erosion was quite high in Togo after the construction of the sea defense, yeah. but then, you know, the success work of the sea defense is also impacting the Togo land. Now, as the, the, the Cape gets built up, it's freeing some sediment into the sediment transport system, which is also helping to build some parts of Keta, uh, sorry, Togo uh, 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 coastline. So they are also receiving some sort of uh, impact from, it wasn't part, you know, we didn't know that that was going to happen. But now it's something we are observing and we can attribute that to the Keta Sea Defense Project. So it's, it's a massive success story we have here. Now I'm stuck in a pile of my own mess. I don't know what it will take, but I I'm coming out. It wasn't meant for me to stay here long and be content. Presently, what we are seeing is that on the western side, um, we seem to be having some accretion especially where we have the Cape St. Paul okay although at a very minimal rate but that is a good story because now sediment are being built up there and this sediment that are being built up there is going to be transported and that will feed absolutely yeah uh, it's interesting because we were just talking about the fact that these groins here go way out to sea apparently quite quite a way out and they're here to try to stop sediment moving along the coast. So you end up with all of this sediment here piling up. But the, the real question is, you can see over there it's already eroding. I mean, you can see these sort of little beach cliffs forming here. And these waves are utterly relentless. They come off the, off the southern Atlantic. And the real question is, how long would this last? I don't know. It might last, I mean, will it last the 99 years they think it will? Or is it going to be 20 years before it completely passes through? And nobody knows. This is Chris Spray from Dundee in Scotland. Um, this is fantastic. Uh, but what's obvious really also is just how low lying this and how important the, uh, the sea defence is. Um, just looking at the mobility of the sand here, it's really, really mobile. And we can see how close the sea is to the, uh, to the current shoreline, let alone to what the shoreline was before. And also, the fishing, um, it looks okay on a day like this, but when the, the wind's going, this must be really quite dramatic in terms of uh, the boats and in terms of the erosion. So these, uh, these big groins, uh, you can see they're having an effect already, and uh, hopefully that'll continue. Basically, we've got into the, um, where they have the floodgates, to control waters that come in so that when um, the level of the water rises then it's opened for the water to go but sometimes there's confusion between them and their community members because they feel that they, they, they would rather want it to be flooded so that they can have a lot of catch and so when it's been opened there's a little and so I think it's been um, quite good we also had a look at the groins at least preventing the erosion that is taking place at the at the coast and it's been very very phenomenal some of these recadments that have been done i think it's been very very phenomenal um there are about six uh, one thing that i noticed is that i understand this thing when it was constructed it was about 240 kilometers deep into the sea but now you could see the edge it means that a lot of things i mean it's been very positive which is a good sign as well so for me so far it's been good it's been good. I, I feel that some of these groins should continue all along so that communities along the coast would not feel deserted. Well, uh, in the past, we were using hand dug wells, shallow hand dug wells. And uh, because we are, we are operating on sandy soils, it means we must irrigate frequently. And with the use of the hand dug wells, the land holdings were very small and uh, farmers resorted to the use of uh, low-lying areas. I'm sure when you were coming you saw three depressions. The lagoon fringes is the fourth one and uh, once the area is depressed they can easily bail out water from a well and thus apply it to the crops. But as time went on uh, with pro population pressure we had to look for other lands, the relatively high lands. And then if you have to dig a well, it will go to a depth of about nine, uh, six meters, depending on the season. In the dry season, in the 
wet season or rainy season, the water table can come close to the surface. But in the dry season, you have to build water from a depth of about three meters. And uh, this is quite laborious. So somehow, we develop our own means of drilling tube wells in this area. And uh, I know the Indians are experts in that. Yes, because I've had a chance of working with some of them. And uh, so we, 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 in fact, we use just PVC pipes to drill to uh, depths up to nine meters. We don't go beyond nine meters. And we get our pumping wells. We put a small pump on them, two horsepower maximum. Because if the pumps are bigger, then you have what we call salt water intrusion. So it's, although we've been, in fact, when I was MC, I tried so that we will get uh, the drillers registered and the farmers so that nobody will go beyond that depth and nobody will put a bigger yeah. pump. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, farming here is continuous. Land is limited. The holdings are very small. Mm? Two beds, three beds, four, and people are happy with that. We are able to produce throughout the year just because we make use of high levels of organic manure. You have uh, manure collecting gangs traveling to the Accra Plains to collect uh, cow dung. Some go as far as Kumasi in the middle belt of Ghana to collect poultry droppings. It's business on its own. You bring one trailer here, the next day farmers will buy everything. So we have been able to sustain agriculture in this area just because we make use of what? A lot of organic manure. So this area is a, what? a carbon sink area. Hmm? <laughs> and, uh, you must give us carbon credits. <laughs> huh? We grow all kinds of vegetables. All kinds of vegetables. And uh, most of it goes to the cities, Accra, Tema. And of course, we grow some exportable ones to chilies. Recently, we piloted the cultivation of butternut. And that one went to UK. Oh, they were very nice, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but unfortunately, the one that we dealt with, the, the, the off-taker, didn't help that much. We recorded about uh, the spotable one, 40 tons per hectare. UK, wait for us, we'll be producing more butternuts for you. <laughs> anyway, now, manure, use in this area is such that uh, uh, in the rainy season it becomes difficult to obtain uh, uh, especially cow dung. So for me, I've uh, added some livestock, that is pig. My main objective or my long term plan is to raise enough pigs to produce enough what? Dung or manure to feed the farm. For now, I can say I'm only at 10%. I still import manure. But my big dream is to expand and then get enough manure for the farm. And uh, in recent times, energy has become a problem for us. And for the fact that we, uh, we are pumping water from the ground, it means we need what? Energy. And the cheapest is hydro. But these days, it is no longer reliable. So I have gone in for what? A biogas digester. Uh, as a pilot, five cubic meter digester and uh, it's doing so well that I've added a, a bag to it, which stores the, the gas. For now, we are using it for cooking. And you know, at the time of slaughtering, we make use of uh, a lot of hot water. 
That's where if you look around, you see a lot of what? Firewood around. But with the installation of the biogas digester, I'm no longer using the firewood. So at least I know I'm not polluting. Hmm? Another credit. <laughs> Another credit. I'm not polluting. My credit. Mm. And uh, I have access. So what I have done, I have acquired a small biogas plant, 5 kV. I'm yet to install it anyway. But then, when it is in installed, I'll be getting a 5 kV from the biogas. We are close to the coast. The wind regime very good. Studies have been conducted, and from here all the way to Ada, perfect for what? Wind energy. And uh, I have shown the way with a uh, small one. One, uh, uh, that's a uh, thousand one, thousand watts, one kV. And aside that, I'm using solar to pump water. Small, small, small. Mm -hmm. I've done my evaluation, I realized that solar is the best. Maintenance virtually free. So if I'm to invest, I'll go into what? More solar pumps. The biogas, for now I'm using just one tenth of the dank that is generated on daily basis. So my next plan is go big, increase the what? The capacity of my gen search. Uh, because we are close to the sea. Mm? In fact, somebody will say that if water is so scarce in this area, then we should opt for drip irrigation. We've tried that. If you look at the back, there have a lot of drip lines there. We've done a lot of studies, but we realize that because we are close to the sea, the sea always brings what aerosols that contain salt. When it is deposited on the leaves of the crops, it scorched them. So, drip irrigation is not the best for this area. So, we make use of what? Sprinkler systems. So, if you move around, all you see is sprinkler irrigation. Drip is the best, but in this environment, you cannot uh, rely on drip. Now, if you look around, Around this time, this is the best cool weather, eh? the best season for vegetable production. Well, this year has been bad. The wave action was severe, so I had to suspend my farming activities just because of the aerosol. Okay, come uh, September, the sea waves will go down, then I can comfortably go in full time. Okay, so from here we'll just go straight to the piggery. It's a small piggery. We normally keep 600 pigs at a time. And that is small. It's small. <laughs> <laughs> no, you, it's small. Yeah, okay. Yeah. 600 is. <laughs> it's really small. Okay. No, I'm saying small because. Hmm? Because of where I'm coming from. Mm, the, the, what huh? they give you, what comes out of them? <laughs> I have a first degree in agriculture, second degree soil science. So I have all the rudiments of farming. So this is small for me. Yeah. Yes. Yes, please. Yes, please. Anyway. And one, one national anthem here has no sound. Mm -hmm. uh, he actually introduced the field well irrigation to the municipality. Let's go. Let's give him a round of applause. A round of applause. You don't need to clap. You just run up. So we'll go around, come back. If you have any question, you ask. Okay. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and it's all about climate change.
Yeah. It's a big. Big one. Yeah. <laughs> Five cubic meter biogas digester it consists of what you call the inlets. Hmm? Every morning when the caretaker collects the dung, he just drops three buckets full of the dung here, add about uh, five buckets of water, mix it, and the slurry flows into this dome-shaped structure, which we call the digester itself. And over here, you know, microorganisms occur freely. Now, in this chamber, the digester, because water has been, or the slurry has come in, air is excluded. So any material that gets into the digester and that goes what we call anaerobic digestion. In the presence of uh, what uh, air, organic materials will be broken down to give you carbon dioxide and water plus the organic material. Then CO2 goes and you know nobody want to talk about that. Okay. But with this Maintain gas is produced, and part of it collects on top of the liquid, which is up there. And this flows. I have a, a gas bag here, it flows into it from there to the kitchen. Now, anytime you add your fish stock and it flows into the digester. There is displacement of uh, the slurry, which is down there, and it comes into this chamber, which we call the displacement tank. Okay, so normally, one, two, three is the digester, but I have added this, okay? And I've put in filters in here. So anything that comes here is filtered and comes here. And because the dung has undergone decomposition, it means some nutrient has been released into this water. We don't want to waste it. So we put a pump here and we pump it, pump, pump it to the field. Okay? So that is with me. I no longer carry cylinders to watch the gas station to fill. So I put up this structure. This way I'm going to install the genset. So waste hmm, is goods in transition. Waste is goods in transition. In fact, there's nothing like waste. So we need to redefine the word waste. Yes, it's waste. Waste is goods in transition. It depends on how you turn it. If you turn it well, you can get a lot of things from it. And get this. And Accra. Eh? All the waste there. Suddenly through something like this. Even if it's 500,000 5, 500, watts that you get, then you have your waste treated. This is the powerhouse. And uh, on top of the building, you can see one half of the solar panel, which is 800 watts. The other half is at the other side. It generates direct current, 1,600 watts. And uh, that uh, direct current goes straight to the pump. We don't have a battery bank for it, meaning that by 7.30, when the sun is up, it starts pumping till about 3.34 when the sun goes down. Okay. 
Now, if you add a battery bank, it means you must add uh, an inverter to the battery. You have to replace them every six, five, six years. It's at a cost. So we design it such that when the sun is up, then it starts working. When it goes off, it's off. You don't need it in the night. The plants need water during the day. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, wind turbine. Mm -hmm. For that one, we have a battery bank for it. As it rotates, it stores the DC current that is generated. Then in the evening, we switch off the ECG completely and we invert. We use an inverter to convert the DC into AC, which we use at the farmhouse. If you do your analysis, you realize that using a solar pump in the long run is cheaper than electricity. No, the solar pump. Wind velocity. It's good. Uh, it's very any, good. Any month very low, it cannot run. No, uh, all the, year. the data is there. Hmm? No, just rough idea. Which month low? Uh, at least we have one month, but it's not. It will, it will not Effect. go off completely. Okay. It's, it's it will still, still run. run. Still run. Yeah, oh, it, it will still sandy? run. It's all sandy. Up to six meters. More than okay. six meters. In fact. Uh, studies conducted in this area shows that we have three different uh, freshwater aquifers. The first one is up to about uh, 16 meters. Then there's a, a clay layer. Then you hit another freshwater aquifer. And that one, we are speculating that the rich charge source is uh, that lagoon. No, that fresh water lagoon behind the Kata lagoon. Okay, let's connect it with the Kata lagoon. lagoon. Avu lagoon. Not Kata lagoon. No, no, not no. Kata is cell line. Another one. So the aquifer runs okay. below the below the lagoon. Okay. 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 Then at a depth of about 200 meters, we have another fresh water aquifer, oh. and the rich charge source is Ho. Yes. <laughs> and that's uh, Afiaringba. That's what has been tapped for oh, water supply. Okay, okay, Anyako, okay. the same. Uh, those communities, they are using the 200 meter. Mm -hmm. Anyako. Anyako. Bolovan. Bolovan. They are using the deep aquifer. So, in fact, we are lucky. We have three fresh water systems. Yeah, yes. For now, we are only tapping the surface one. The and one tap, where is the source of bottom one? Is there any source? Or yeah, it's, yeah, it's uh, the rich touch point is no. the, from the regional capital of the Volta region. Study has been done? Study has been done, but not, 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 sure. not, not, not enough data. Mm -hmm. We don't have enough data. Like the second aquifer I'm, uh, I was talking about, I think no study has been done. Because we punctured it here once, and it behaved like an artesian well. Yes. Mm. Um, in fact, uh, we have received some support from Danida. Mm? We did a lot of studies in this area, and we finally established a total, what we call a total weather station which measures all weather parameters every five minutes and water quality every five minutes. And uh, the data, mm, it goes straight to Legon. So somehow we are monitoring the, the underground system. The only times that we panic, farmers, mm, we, we really panic. When uh, in the rainy season, women don't have good rains. And in the dry season, everybody is pumping water. Mm? Then we begin to panic. 
because the fresh water lens will become thinner and thinner. And if you are not careful, salt water intrusion. Then it means I'll have to find my way and join my friend in Accra. <laughs> so we'll be migrating. Yes. <laughs> well, In fact, we have one umbrella group, yeah. mm -hmm. but then the water use is independent. Everybody has its own pumping well, but we, we rely on the data that is generated to advise ourselves. Even as a farmer, mm, we, I have a what, a conductivity meter, the conductivity meter and I allow farmers to bring water samples. We check it for them. When the salinity is going up, we caution them, just suspend your farming activities. If not, salt will go into your tube well, and that will be the end. So do you sometimes experience situations where salinity is going up? Yes, in the dry season. In the dry season. Why Around in the wet season. The whole system is diluted, but in the dry season, as you pump, the fresh water lens thins out, and the salinity increases gradually. So if you don't monitor it, one day you, what, hap what will happen is, you realize that your crop will not be growing. Initially, hmm, when I came, this whole place was bushy. And when I started clearing it, I realized that there were snakes, a lot of snakes around. Why did that? Snakes. And, uh, How many snakes? Uh, <laughs> many. Many, yeah? Many big snakes, cobra, or? Vipers. 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 Feed vipers. Feed vipers. Oh. How many? They don't bite. They don't bite. Bite. Can you show us any snakes? No. 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 In fact, initially I only came to work on my land. How how much land do you have? Twenty acres. Twenty acres. How many? Sorry. Twenty. Twenty acres. But when I realized that there were so many snakes in the uh, bush, I have to clear it so that they will not get to the farmhouse. That's how come my farm is. But now it's like the population has gone down, so I was certainly going for the poultry. Mm. Yeah, but I think you should try to change over to organic rather than half chemical. The half problem organic. is you know, when you produce organic vegetables, and you send them to the, where they buy them, Accra, people don't differentiate between organic. They, they will not even pay the court cost. Yeah. yeah. So for now, we are just uh, combining the organic and inorganic. Production but cost. There, at least we have two farmers who are into the production of very pure organic vegetables. I'm coming.